all right uh, i think uh, let's get started uh, welcome to the machinery development uh, meeting uh, today is uh, september 29th and we have 11 people on the call right now uh, we have a couple of picks lined up today and uh, uh, let's start with uh, the upcoming machinery release so machinery uh, we are going to release a new version of machinery soon uh, most probably this by this week so it is v0.6 release so we are currently at v0.5 and uh, this release would have a lot of uh, new features so uh, uh, both uh, in machinery functionalities like uh, uh, supporting uh, multiple uh, uh, platforms uh, supporting kubernetes out of the box and all those stuff so uh, if you look at the roadmap uh, you can see some of these uh, uh, new features that will be there in this release so uh, making such a, uh, a big uh, uh, major release uh, uh, requires a lot of testing from our part uh, we need to ensure uh, uh, we have ux consistency and uh, we have functionality across uh, as expected across uh, all these uh, machinery use cases so we had gone over this uh, machinery uh, test plan uh, in, in last week's meeting uh, so i wanted to call out this again so there are still uh, a couple of uh, areas that uh, needs uh, people to uh, sign up and test it out. So basically what this uh, test plan describes is a set of actions that a, a user can take to interact with machinery. So all of these are supposed to work. So, and uh, what a tester is expected to do is test out these scenarios and note down the uh, note down their result and uh, possibly open up issues uh, if there is any uh, functional uh, discrepancies or uh, ux inconsistencies so uh, if the ux is not uh, up to the mark or it's not intuitive you can also report that so, new, quick question um has have the folks that have been that are signed up have we been seeing results coming back just yet uh yeah we, we are seeing a couple of uh, results but most of the results are empty now so uh i also want to point out that e even if uh, a tester has signed up to test a particular component uh it doesn't mean uh, you can't sign up for that, but please feel free to uh, sign up if another person has already signed up as well. So, yep. Okay, let me ask, let me ask about a couple of specific ones if I could. On uh, Root Rocks, do you, do we have either of the two GitHub actions scheduled? Um, no, not yet. Um, I was doing a little work on this today, and right now they are Docker-based, so they would install Mishri on Docker, and I don't think that we need that, so I'm moving them to Kubernetes first, and after that, yeah, probably. Is the move to, so, or ideally we would be testing both platforms, Docker and Kubernetes, right now, is there, are there unresolved challenges in running and using Docker as the platform in the actions? No, like they, they work right now. There's no trouble in using Docker right now, so. Cool, okay. Yeah, those, um, the reason I bring up those two, particularly the SMP, the Service Mesh Performance GitHub Action is that is that it'll cover quite a few, quite a bit of code. So that, that's good, that's good. Cool. Um, for just at, I don't know, somewhat randomly, um, there's a, some tests that Neha, uh, Neha, is her last name Laha? I don't think she's on at the moment. 
uh, but she's been in the community for some time. She'd been wanting to uh, work on um, Meshri's provisioning of Prometheus. Today, Meshri doesn't directly, well, Meshri provisions Prometheus and Grafana if those two components are add-ons to or, or part and parcel to a specific service mesh, but Meshri doesn't separately provision Prometheus or Grafana independently. And that's been uh, one of Meshri's users had made that request. It's also not only advantageous to the to users potentially, but it's also advantageous to Meshri that needs to collect any number of statistics about the nodes or um, or the service meshes, the, the traffic and things that are going on. And so it was a well-placed request. Anyway, point is Neha wanted to go work on that request. And so she was working on test cases here on line 190 through 190, 197. Um, and in her notes, so, so I guess, okay. So these are just her notes, not the actual outcome. In her notes, she's just having trouble with setting it up in her environment. Or, or, Yeah, it, it couldn't, she, it's, she must be having trouble in her environment because I'm able to see data across these. I know she was having network connectivity challenges. So, okay, just a random like check on status. So I'll, I'll follow up her, with her on that, but yeah, Rude Rocks, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> those those uh, actions are, be quite helpful even if you just take the current docker one and just like uh, apply a schedule to it and I, and I kind of make a weird face because i'm not sure that github actions natively support the concept of a cron like the concept of scheduling they generally want to be triggered from some other event or a manual invocation and we can go there are plenty of events going on, plenty of activities and events going on in our repositories that could be a trigger, or we can separately use a different system to trigger. But, but yeah, if you would let me know if there's a native solution to scheduling, great. We should probably lean into that. If not, the CNCF has given us um, uh, a Zapier account to uh, run things. And so we might go create a cron job in there to, to kick off the. I think GitHub Actions support like cron as a trigger event. So we should be able to schedule runs. Cool. Nice. Thank you, Nivendu. All right. Uh... Just to put you on, put ask a question of you as well in the Vendu. Um, um, any particular, any particular trouble spots that you've noticed, or any um, maybe any areas that your that concern you more than the next, or that need a little more attention. Uh, uh, if you are going to uh, deploy it to Kubernetes by default, then one of the areas that we need to fix is uh, the discovering machinery endpoint. So it, it is broken as of now. So, and we we actually, uh, in machinery CTL, we actually show the user a, a false endpoint. So we need to make it, uh, we need to have a fail safe or, or we need to fix the, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe to Michael's point, I don't know if he made this point exactly, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe to, to use even more precise language, it's, uh, what would you say? It's, um, boy, words, words fail me, but it, it's something like, uh, it, it's, 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 it's halfway functional, like, it, it'll tell you, it'll give you the correct answer sometimes. <laughs> if you ask slowly enough, like, like the, the challenge here is really, really more, well, it can be around the logic that's being used inside of MeshKit to discern what the actual ultimate um, external cluster facing IP address or reference to Meshery's endpoint is. 
But there's also a lot of it has to do with timing as well. Like if you imagine Meshery CTL as an asynchronous um, client that you know runs over a, a moment in time where it's provisioning Meshery, like Kubernetes is provisioning these systems and and the the deployments and the services can take a little while to come up. The if you have a load balancer integration as well, that might take a little while to provision an IP and expose it. And so uh, there's a what my point is outside of just asking ourselves if the logic for identifying an endpoint is correct, there's also the troublesome concept of, of timing. And, and it's not like Meshery CTL can necessarily sit there forever and just waiting for the a cluster IP, a node port, or a load balancer to be exposed, uh, because it, you know sometimes those things, those processes get stuck. So if if it was supposed to be a load balancer in particular, um, you can get into a pending state and just or Kubernetes can get into a pending state and just kind of stay there. And so, so anyway, hopefully that sheds a little more light on the the challenge. It it could be that you know there are ways to. Um, there are band-aids in the meantime of things like uh, you know ha having separate ad hoc routines that people can do to like maybe it mesh, mesh CTL gets the wrong endpoint and people try to connect and they can't and then if they were to if we made it more a little more prominent the fact that they can run a system check and if the Meshery CTL system check or something similar would re-verify, you know the the current con where you know the the location of the current context endpoint, like so. So that plagues. Sounds like that that really only is the concern of Kuba in cluster deployments, not out of cluster. Okay. It could also be the case that like, you know, like a, a poor man's, again, another Band-Aid here, or kind of another, is like at the end of the message where it says, we think, we, we, you know, we can change the language like uh, conceptually or supposedly or purportedly, <laughs> Meshery's endpoint is, you know, here. If you're not finding that, then double check it with a kubectl get s service namespace Meshery, and then, you know, verify, like run this command to re-verify. Uh, you know, like there can be one of those commands, like sometimes it takes a while, rerun this command to verify. So that's actually what we do at the end of the Helm chart install, which is like the English is, and I talk to Asuko a lot about this, so it's okay that I say this, like it's horrific English. He's actually full-time studying, he quit his job, he's just full-time studying English. So, so maybe after he's done with his English exam, he can come back and rewrite what the Helm chart says at the end. But 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 point is like when we're done in, through Helm chart installation, we also try to tell the user here's how here's the instructions from which you can go discern your endpoint. So yeah, not that anyone. It's very evident like from all from a lot of the users that Mastery has, no one reads anything, <laughs> which is like I, probably true of all of us. Like who has ever who has ever reached out to the docs for anything. Um, which is why I hope that doesn't dismay a lot of people when I say that. Actually, I hope it's encouraging, like for those that have spent time on the error codes utility, that like while people don't generally go to the docs and start reading, they do go to Google and search for um, some unique moniker that would actually put them into the um, docs. So, okay, so yeah, gosh, I guess with all of that. Um, it's not, the, yeah. Okay. We don't have a regression issue or we don't, like this, that behavior has been there for a while. We haven't had entirely the correct behavior. I think you'll notice that as Michael or others go through sort of tests to confirm and verify the behavior and understand the behavior in that area, I, my hunch would be that you might find that it takes a couple of times of running the like the mesh CTL system start command for you to that for it to ultimately derive or, or arrive at the, the correct endpoint in part because of those timings. So 
Anyway, there's a couple of poor man, there's a couple of band-aids suggested in there that we might want to consider. Everybody else has band-aids, right? That's not just US thing. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, I think uh, we have a couple of uh, newcomers on the call today. Uh, so I think uh, uh, Aditya, like, is this your first time on the call? Uh, this call? Aditya uh, Narayan. Yeah. It's uh, not the first time, but yeah, I have, I have stayed in like a couple of them, like two of them. Oh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, yes, you're audible. Oh, all right. Okay, uh, so I'm Aditya Narayan Suvedi. I'm studying as a third year undergraduate computer engineering in India. I originally live in Nepal. And that's it. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Aditya. Uh, uh, Vedant, uh, I think you are new here. Uh, would you also like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, I think it's Ron. Ron. My name is Vedan Kakade and I am a junior pursuing my bachelor's in computer engineering from uh, Nagpur, India. And I'm uh, a uh, web development and uh, DevOps enthusiast and I'm passionate about open source. Thank you, Vedanta. Welcome to the community. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, or who is here for the first time? Uh, all right, then uh, welcome. Welcome to all the new newcomers. Uh, on the topic, uh, Nidish has some updates on uh, state management in Meshri UI. Nidish, would you like to take it from you? Yeah, sure. It's, it's just a small update that uh... <laughs> We actually have a spreadsheet where we are tracking uh, all the components that are that has to be created. And yeah, give me a sec. So yeah, there we go. So uh, this particular spreadsheet has all the components that uh, we have to create in order for uh, us to refactor the whole code base. And actually, this is just the. Um, I mean, these are. Uh, for now, like these are the global components that are that we're going to be reusing uh, all over Mishri UI, and this list uh, will keep on uh, adding up. <laughs> but yeah, this is start. The plan is to first complete these things because like uh, all the other components that we are going to create will be uh, uh, it will be created based on these components. So we'll be using these components to create uh, as a component. So the plan is to create these things first and then move on to the more uh, uh, complex components. So. Um, there is an open PR right now for, uh, yeah, people are actually working on it, you can see, and uh, if, if you guys are interested, you can actually take these up and uh, start working on them and create a PR, like all the details that you need uh, in order to, uh, and basically the contribution guide to uh, this particular uh, thing is uh, in the readme file, in the new meshery uh, UA restructuring branch. I'll just show it right now. So yeah, this particular readme file has uh, instructions uh, that one has to follow for uh, yeah, uh, particularly this section has uh, all the instructions that one has to follow in order for him to contribute to uh, UA restructuring. So yeah, if anyone's interested, then uh, they can go through this and they can start contributing right away. And yeah, we'll be reviewing the PRs uh, strictly and uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, the code that we're going to write is uh, in good quality and all those stuff. So uh, yeah, not much of an update, it's just uh, like we need people to, uh, we need more people to work on this so that we can get this done fast. Uh, 
it's just a call to action so yeah anybody has any comments yeah it is uh can you observe here yeah, yeah uh, i can uh, hear you <clears throat> so like i just wanted to know like uh, how actually can what can i approach uh, this uh, like uh, this for kind of uh, problem so could you give a little bit introduction to uh, how like we can uh, go through this and create component for us an example yeah sure sure i'll okay actually there are some uh, okay, i have there are some components that are already created which uh, uh, can be an inspiration so one of them is uh, okay actually basically like uh, we do not have a lot of components right now and uh, these are the ones that are pretty basic but i should give you an idea as to how we should start writing components so if you take okay, a look okay, at this okay. yeah if you take a look at this chip components pretty basic it doesn't do anything else other than it is uh, like uh, usually like when we have a usually like for all the chip components that we're going to use usually need to change it change the cursor to the pointer and uh, you know add some padding and we are actually exporting i mean doing those changes over here and exporting the component but this is very uh, basic in the sense that we are not uh, uh, expanding we are not making it uh, we are not doing many changes we are not doing changes on top of this thing but when you look at uh, this paper component we are actually doing some changes in the sense that uh, uh, this custom paper we are actually just making the uh, making the styling changes that will be uh, that will be using uh, all over the uae in the sense that we will be add, we are adding padding so that like whenever you use the custom uh, we use the paper then it is uh, mm, like we have the consistent padding all over the ui and actually if you look at this particular paper title component it uh, it we are actually doing some things on top of uh, custom paper the sense that uh, mm, okay it uh, would be better if i can show it just a bit yeah yeah nice now one second so you can see that uh, this uh, component that we're seeing over here all these things these are uh, these are just paper components but uh, you can actually see that there is a pattern to all of these things in the sense that we have a heading and we have the content and we actually have some padding over here so basically we can actually uh, this is this this one will be a common thing that will be using everywhere even like in the outer paper you can see that we have a heading and we have uh, um, this content so if you look at this code we have actually separated out that logic and uh, it is now like um you can actually like this component can be named something else or whatever but uh, paper with uh, we, we are naming it paper with title and uh, you're actually mm, yeah you can pass in the title and that would be uh consistent consistent in the sense that the uh, all the stylings that we are going to apply will be uh same for all the paper if you are using the same component so yeah this is a this would be a good inspiration i guess you can take a look at this thing and actually we are doing some other things so that it is uh, more flexible in the sense that we can uh, we are not restricted to using only uh, text for the um, title no and yeah we are actually making it flexible by uh, allowing us to have uh, allowing us to use a uh, custom components as well so yeah and actually these three components are uh, yeah these are not very basic because like these uh, these this i don't think this would actually belong here because uh, considering that this components folder is something that uh, we are going to use re globally reuse everywhere because uh, a navbar uh, is something that we are going to use uh, only once in the whole ui so this might not um, seem a very uh, what to say it, it might not seem very uh, intuitive in the first uh, at the first time but uh, when you go over this you can find some of the patterns that uh, we will be following all over the ui so that like that would actually be helpful for you to uh, understand basically like we are we, we are actually following a pattern so uh, it would be better if you could uh, easily follow the same thing and uh, in the whole ui so yeah just take a look at these components and uh, yeah, yeah that's it. and actually this uh, mm. readme file is this actually good. explains what are the yeah yes. good 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 yeah please do read through the readme and uh, so um yeah <laughs> good, good good um next actually so so to jump back so sorry to interrupt folks but we need to cut the cut and move um to to one of the top priorities is trying to get the release out for v060 
And Neha, your ears are burning. We were just talking about you a moment ago. Neha, this could be um, toward the end of the call. If you'd like, maybe we could just do a quick troubleshoot of your environment to, to, to yes. confirm. Okay, cool. So maybe we'll- Yeah, just uh, let me, uh, just let me log into my setup. I'll share soon. Cool, sounds good. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Nidisha. Uh, the next item uh, is from Ashish. Ashish, would you like to give an update on the component registration? Yeah. So uh, the component registration is uh, currently in a working state. Uh, if you, but it's not in a working state in the current release because of one reason that uh, uh, the the Q Open API JSON schema binary that is required for generating components, Kubernetes components, is uh, that that was I guess zero point one point zero version that has been seeded, but we need uh, zero point one point two, and uh, I guess Rudraksh has created a PR for it, and I don't know if it's merged or not. So after that gets merged, uh, the error that we were having in the latest release that would go away. And now coming to the second thing, uh, so I was uh, going to demo it today, but um, unfortunately I am not able to. There are a lot of errors that I have already. Uh, uh, that I have already discussed with uh, Nitish on Slack uh, that I'm facing uh, while uh, you while basically while using the while trying to use those components in in the mesh map, uh, my mesh map keeps breaking because when the components get registered, uh, Nitish is uh, working on it, trying to figure out what's uh, what can be done for that, and if um, he can tell me the structure, uh, uh, if he's not able to make a lot of tweaks in the UI, I would I have actually a callback which can um, which can restructure the definitions and schemas the way we want to. Uh, so if uh, he can't do it at the UI part, I'll do it uh, at the back end. So after we we get it done, I guess by tomorrow we'll have it working. That was update from my side. Uh, okay. Comments to Ashish. Uh... Oh, Lee, Lee, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to know. I will, um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's too bad. We, we missed the deadline. Um, yeah, please please do work through that as quick as you can, uh, Ashish. Uh, Nidish, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, no, actually, uh, I just know about the JSON file and I'm actually working on it right now. Yeah, I'll try to figure out if I can, uh, whatever I can do with our UI. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, thank you. I think we can, we can test it after the release by the message CTL pattern apply command and it should work. So, uh, I think that should work. Of course, do you uh, think there can be a problem there if we are having problems in mesh map? Uh, no, uh, they are inter uh, like they are not interrelated. So the same problem will not cause any issues with the server. But if the if the if for any reason the structure of uh, if the structure of the schema is not valid, in that case, definitely even the even the uh, server would refuse to apply that particular pattern. So it, it would depend that what the exact cause of the issue is. Is it the UI or is it something wrong with the structure of the schema? Yeah, that I believe I am yet to test it out because uh, uh, from what I understood from the error code that uh, error that was showing up, uh, for some reason the uh, it was not able to replace the like we are using a regex to replace the names so that it is more formatted for for the user to see right so. Uh, that's where it is breaking in the sense that it's not it is not able to replace that uh, uh, particular string uh, because of which is it is returning and it is not re returning and it is not returning a string which uh, uh, which breaks the execu execution there. So yeah, I'll I'll have to look into it why it is happening in the UI. Uh, all right. Uh, Lavendu, can I go ahead and share? Can I? I can share oh, my screen. Uh, Neha, like, uh, can we uh, move that to the end of the meeting? Uh, just okay. so that we co cover the topics. Uh, okay, sure, sure. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, thanks, Ashish, for the uh, update. Uh, uh, next up, uh, we have an update on the multiple import options in the patterns UI. Uh, Gaurav, would you like to? Yeah. It? So, yeah, currently I won't be able to demo it because I'm logged in with Windows. But uh, yeah, definitely I will speak about the update that I demoed day before yesterday on the Wasm call. So previously, uh, what I did for the multiple import was a model over a model. So that was not at all an intuitive approach. So what I did was um, having a drop down menu with showing multiple import options like upload from uh, local and browser plus uh, GitHub upload and URL upload. So for that, uh, regarding the GitHub upload, I had a For the GitHub upload, I had a talk with uh, Utkarsh, so he explained me all the concepts for having the UI and all the test cases. So that was a quick update. Uh, Gaurav, like, is there an open PR for this? Uh, no, that's not an open PR. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh... uh okay uh uh so like will this be going into the uh, b0.6 release like do we need to get that done bef uh no but because the github one is a quite big approach so it will take time okay yep uh and i think like uh megna was working on uh fixing some bugs around that part. Uh, and I think she gave an update on the last uh, Wasm call. Uh, Megan, like, uh, could you just mention that on the meeting minutes? Uh... Yeah, uh, so, so I haven't changed much uh, when it comes to the components. Like, uh, this sh like the recent, up recent PR that I uh, opened, that, sh that shouldn't change anything for Gaurav, actually. So, uh, the way it was before he started, it's just like that only. So it shouldn't be a problem for him. Uh, but let me just share the PR just in case. Uh, this is the PR, right? Um, yeah. Yes, yes. That is the, that is the old one. Cool. So I, I, I don't yeah, really I need... that is the one. That is the one. And you, you, I wasn't able, I wasn't able to join Mom Monday's meeting on Wasm filters. So I don't mean to make people like redemo the same thing that they might have shown earlier. I just, uh, for my own edification, clarification, I wasn't sure if, uh, so the, I wasn't sure how much of the effort is is aligned and, and potential. And I don't think it's overlapping, but to just re-articulate part of the goal here for those that have seen the new types of content, patterns, filters, and applications in Meshery, in the UI, people have, you know, users have the ability to upload and Megana and Gaurav primarily have been iterating on the various ways in which people can upload and manage their, that type of content, manage patterns, filters, and applications. And and I think that we've congealed um, on a design that, uh, more or less on a design I thought that Gaurav had come forth with, which was, you know, you click this, this import button and you get a modal that um, gives you kind of four choices for the various ways in which you can import a piece of content. And uh, I guess my question is, is just, is that, is just to confirm that that's still the current goal. And, and if it is, it's, I mean, that component or that thing that we should be hopefully making as a component is set to be reused about four times. So in, in the patterns UI, the filters UI, the application UI, and then external plugins as well, like mesh map. So is that about, is that what we're still aiming for?
Mm, yep. Uh, the model is now changed to a integrated drop-down list, and that is totally reusable across the four of them. Got you. Okay. So the the user experience now is someone clicks on this on the import or the on the import button, and they see a drop-down like right next to their mouse, and they they choose one of the four ways. Yeah. I see. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, thanks for clarifying that, uh, Gaurav. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Utkarsh, uh, would you like to uh, give an update on the multi-cluster support? Yep, um, I can demo a bit um, and probably be able to also tell how others can also sort of replicate what I have, what the setup that I have for testing. So, let me share the screen for that. So, um, this is my mystery setup. It's uh, looking uh, quite exactly how you would see it when uh, when you would deploy mystery. Uh, what I'm doing here is I have uh, run mystery studio system start hyphen p Kubernetes. This is a command that I run. This spin up a uh, mystery in my bind cluster. So these are the components that are running. It, these are fewer than what you would expect because I have my context customized for me. Um, so yeah, uh, basically this is how I set up my mystery. After setting this up, I did uh, a Jupyter edit and then I edited my deployment. To change that image name, it's a temporary change. This is just for testing out the multi-cluster change because it's a huge change. It's, 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 it has a very huge surface area for potential bugs and uh, th there would be different bugs. So uh, that is why there is a temporary deployment of um, mystery on this particular uh, on this particular um, GitHub username. That is Kush23 slash mystery colon stable hyphen latest. This is the version of mystery which has the changes associated with multi-context <clears throat> and it's using um, staging uh, mystery cloud staging environment and a few other things that would be relevant to get this thing working i have mentioned all of these things in um, in uh, slack mystery channel i would share the link for the same in uh, in the chat so that uh, others can also replicate this environment and test this things out and uh, test this thing out so regarding Multi context. So if you would see this setup, I have uh, actually this is a um, this is a, just to address this error shortly quickly. This error that we are getting is because uh, I'm running the latest version of uh, Kubernetes in in my mini kube cluster, which is my current context, and um, it doesn't uh, it has promoted its uh, custom resource definition um, uh, uh, resource from v1 v1 to I guess v1. So that is why this error is showing up. Uh, this is not something associated with uh, mission. Uh, I'm running Minikube cluster. This is my, actually, I'm running Minikube cluster as well as Kind cluster. Uh, kind cluster is my in cluster. And that is, uh, this is where mystery is actually deployed. While Minikube is my secondary cluster. Uh, right now I'm uh, connected with uh, Minikube. So let's say um, I want to perform any operation. The reason I'm actually going to deploy uh, I, I'm going to apply a custom YAML is because um, is because uh, uh, as uh, I was mentioning that uh, Kubernetes version has changed, so there are some custom resource definition changes. So actually, right now, uh, Istio deployment and other service mesh deployments are sort of uh, sort of not going exactly the, uh, that uh, they, they are supposed to. So let's uh, just for the purpose of demo, let's um, try deploying. <clears throat> something a very simple application this is nothing but nginx i'm going to apply this um, and the manifest has been applied uh, if you would see the cluster it is it is all running okay i should have did, okay let's do this it's uh, deleted from my test namespace and Huh. Demoing 
um, multi context is sort of difficult. It's sort of tricky because I have to switch between multiple um, contexts um, all the time to show how the state of the cluster is. I'm applying the uh, context, uh, I'm applying the manifest, I'm connected with Minikube cluster. So what I would expect after things operation is uh, uh, I will have two replicas of Nginx running on my cluster, uh, on my Minikube cluster, and uh, it is, um, it uh, communicated with the Minikube cluster. Now, if I would go ahead and uh, change the, change my active context from Minikube to in cluster, um, and I would go back to, let's say Istio and try to, the exact same thing that I did in the in the mini key cluster in my kind cluster, I would expect that I have test uh, that is uh, two nginx deployments, uh, two nginx replicas running in my kind cluster. So let's see if that is the case. Um, and it is although. Let's see this. I'm deleting the deployment because it was already present in my cluster. So it was not much of a demo because it, it, it was already there. But now what I did was uh, deleted the two replicas uh, and it did got deleted. So uh, basically the update is about that how Mishri can now support multiple contexts at the same time. It's uh, not to, uh, so in terms of uh, this particular functionality has been um, mostly added on the server side. That is now server can support any number of uh, contexts. Uh, the UI, as you may have noticed, that uh, right now we don't have any toggle buttons here. Let's say, uh, which would say that okay, now right now you're performing operations on Minikube or you're performing operations on Kind Cluster. This is something that would be uh, added uh, very soon. Uh, the current PR or uh, the current uh, PR that I've created that is mostly about adding adding multi context support on the server side, uh, and this is uh, what the demo was mostly about. Uh, the reason, the another reason I did the interest one is because, uh, as uh, Navidu initially mentioned, that now we are moving more towards uh, Kubernetes uh, as a default platform. So this is uh, mostly the environment that you would expect Meshri to be running in in the future, and this is how probably you would be able to interact with. You can actually ping your clusters, multiple clusters uh, uh, from the UI, uh, and other changes uh, would be uh, present in the UI in the future. So yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. I'll share the link for uh, the Slack message in the chat so that probably others can also, others can also see the, see how they can replicate this particular environment so that they can test stuff out. Who's got, who's got feedback for Utkarsh? questions on how this works. I'll put a challenge out there. I'll say, I'll say this, um, Woodkarsh is good, but he's not that good. Or, or rather, there's got a, there's a bug in here somewhere. I can, you, you, I can smell it from here. Like there's a, uh, um, hey, Utkarsh, a couple of, we haven't only gotten to chat through some of the item. You know what, we have like 15, Navendi, what else do we have on the uh, agenda? Maybe I should. Oh, we have uh, two small demos and okay. uh, I I'll think wait. Luke isn't on the call. Cool, I'll, I'll, good. I'll wait to learn. But anybody else have questions for Utkarsh? Concerns, caveats? Tomatoes? Quick verification, Utkarsh, the only question I'll ask is the, yeah, never mind. You're, you're showing it right now, which is the silent, the concurrent. Oh, okay, let me change the question then. Um, uh, mesh sync is reporting in correctly objects from both of those two clusters. Uh, yep, yeah, actually, so now I, it's, it's not very, as, as you may have noticed, it's not as uh, interactive as uh, the rest of the mysteries you are at the moment, because it's not using subscriptions not. So now I changed the context to Minikube. So you can see it says, uh, 
measure of it is not deployed. Uh, the deployment is not succeeding because of the error that uh, uh, that popped up at a hey customer service definition. And uh, yeah, so it is reporting the accurate status of mesh sync in mesh operator as per your context. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, it's some caveat that is it's it's not getting deployed at the moment in the uh, in latest um, one dot two dot two. Uh, uh, other comments here, uh, Lee. Like, may, let's let's look into this right now. It's it's a, like uh, if you have comments, let's. Uh, uh, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Just a couple of quick, um, like clarifying questions. Things that I'm that um, that while I enjoy razzing Utkarsh and, and anyone else who lets me razz them, uh, that I these are things that I'm that I know these are already considered, and so the. I was just uh, had just circled Darren Lau's um, name on a piece of paper. So Darren is some of you all know Darren, and some of you don't. And he's a recent uh, community member, recently joined, and um, is just he lives in New York. He works at Cisco. He's a relatively um, younger individual, um, bright guy, nice guy. Seemed to make an impact quickly, and he was working on the meshery operator. Uh, and, and the Helm charts for Meshery Operator. And consequently, it was touching Mesh Sync as well, just primarily in terms of its deployment. Um, and so there's, there's a, so multi-cluster support inherently involves multi-operator things, uh, multi-Mesh Sync things. Today, if you're unfamiliar, and I bet someone will drop a link to the Meshery Architecture deck, the Meshery Architecture deck, um, should be uh, highlighting to you all that Meshery's object model has a one-to-one -one relationship between um, Meshery operator and a Kubernetes cluster. So another way of saying that is that for each Kubernetes cluster, there should be one and only one. Well, currently there should be one and only one meshery operator deployment. The operator contains mesh sync and NATS, the other two icons that you're seeing on the screen. Um, I chuckled because at some point we should have uh, what's a, a server, a leader, God, what, are the, what are the PC terms, leader? A leader worker uh, type setup such that it's an HA um, configuration. So, like it, technically, maybe there would be multiple operators, but they would be operating as the same logical operating logical like brain, logical unit. Anyway, um, anyway, I think, it's, I think it's follower, leader follower. Oh, thank you. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Is that the Michael? Do you? I struggled with this with respect to um, Kubernetes clusters having the server and the workers, or the, do you know the terms there as well? Uh, control plan. No, okay. I think they're, uh, they're workers. Um, Work. Yeah, worker nodes and... <laughs> not that you ask, sorry. <laughs> yeah. They're the workers, right? Yeah, sure. The workers and then the other one that's in charge. Control, maybe, yeah. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, which is, there's a couple of items. There's a small item with respect to MeshSync's um, version. MeshSync is actually on like version 1.22 or something like that, One dot, something higher. It's not being accurately reflected here, um, which means I don't think it's being actively built into the build of the, the thing. I don't know. There's an open issue. There's also, um, yeah, I mean, to the extent that um, there's multiple chips for individual Kubernetes clusters, that's fantastic. There, you know, at some point you would expect there might be, well, th there might be multiple chips for operators. And, and the reality is, or likely, or my, my reality is that 
that we probably ultimately wouldn't have multiple chips <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because it, uh, some of the users that are gonna put Meshery to the test, they're gonna deploy Meshery in, in an 80 cluster environment or, or a 400 cluster environment, right? That's not uncommon. And over time, the trend has been smaller and smaller clusters, smaller blast radius, Matter of fact, Meshery is extremely well oriented to be your local dev, um, not cluster manager, but service mesh manager for dev, facilitating dev and prod and things. So point is from a UX perspective, not just UX, but just a usability perspective that you would, uh, we wouldn't be able to line up so many chips in a row. It's not just about fitting on the screen. That's one issue, but but the other issue, it becomes much more apparent when, when you go to consider this, that like, Okay, so if we we're going to represent, you know, let's just say four connections to clusters that we would also then represent four individual operators with, you know, mesh sync and NATs, and it becomes <clears throat> users won't, won't one control one component on this screen needs to control the others. So when you switch to, and this isn't like this, it really isn't feedback aimed at Utkarsh per se, like the, he did a massively sweeping change, uh, both on the back end and then. Um, starting on the front end. And so this is just I, the first time we're sort of talking aloud, I think about um, how some of, how, how this feature would have sweeping ramifications across the user interface as well, is that they're, they're likely, or again, from my perspective, there becomes the need to, um, just like when you're using Meshery CTL, anytime you're running a, a command, you're implicitly executing that command in context of a, a meshery deployment. You're always running those commands in a particular context. You don't have to specify the context because it's implicit, like it's your current context. And that functions very similar to how kubectl functions and how, to, how a lot of other software functions is like you're, you're doing some things and you're doing it um, in, under some implicit context. And so right now the content, the, the, the literal Kubernetes cluster that's being used is called in cluster. And so as a user were to navigate to other screens and they were to execute certain things, they would be doing it in, con in context of that context, in context of that cluster. That becomes something that people do, they wanna be able to do, they wanna, they wanna um, eat, <laughs> they wanna eat their cake and have it too. Meaning they wanna be able to execute operations against a specific cluster. And at the same time, they also want to have a view that shows them um, information from multiple clusters. But when they poke at something, they want it to just maybe affect that cluster, or they might want to affect all clusters. And so inevitably we'll need to devise some controls that are fairly prevalent, prevalent and pretty ubiquitous across every UI around context and switching contexts and potentially having letting operations apply to multiple contexts. So like a quick fix to, if someone connects to 10 clusters, like a quick fix to here is to have a, like a dropdown um, that they can um, select from which cluster they want to interact with. Now, eventually like that dropdown, if there are 400 clusters, like you're looking at a dropdown that's like you scroll forever. It's not the best control either. Fine, you can have a dropdown with a search at the top and all that, but. Anyway, point is once that happens and someone selects a current co uh, context to interact with, that can update the other components on the screen with information about the operator that's you know, respective to that cluster. That same kind of a um, multi checkbox like dropdown, if it has checkboxes as well, can work well for other screens in which maybe they're connected to 10 clusters. They wanna execute an operation against two of them, but not the other eight. So they, they may want to have multiple they, want, they, may want, they may want to have multiple current contexts. Meshery is offer the, offers them power that they, in that way, that they wouldn't necessarily find in every other tool. They would find that power in some other tools, but not all. So anyway, th this new feature becomes a pervasive consideration across um, an implicit consideration one that people didn't have to consider and the UI didn't have to consider in the past because it was just a single connection.
but now it becomes something that needs to be surfaced. So Udkarsh or Navendu, if you navigate to life cycle, to any one of the um, service meshes, um, we would probably expect, again, like if we have this pervasive and ubiquitous, I guess those are about the same thing, but if we have this um, component that uh, uh, context selector, and we have this confirmation that's um, ever present that confirms this is the context in which you're operating currently. And if you click a single click button, it's gonna happen in this context. It, 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 like those, that's the kind of thing that like, there are some UXers on the phone or on the call that could maybe help here. So uh, actually a few things that I meant, uh, forgot to mention um, because I was demoing. So a few features have been also added, not just um, adding support for multiple contexts. The features are like, um, um, uh, let's say uh, I have this mystery instance and I, I uh, let this be connected to the public internet. If someone gets access to this and if they can log in, so uh, some authentication happens after that, you would be able to access uh, the context associated with this particular mystery instance. So you would be able to communicate with the cluster if you are if you are part of the same mystery instance. Um, the provided uh, it's it's uh, so this won't work. That is, uh, um, this is connected to public internet and you're logged in with none provider and so on. So that won't uh, work because of authentication reason. Uh, but uh, it definitely context sharing is a thing. Second is that um, second feature that has been added is um, uh, if two users are connected or a number of users are connected to the same mystery instance, all of them can have different context and mystery would take care of that. So let's say um, I am using Minikube context, but you want to perform some action on in cluster context or uh, the kind cluster, uh, you can do that. The mystery will take care of isolating all of the operations. Uh, another thing that has been added is that, um, uh, let's say you, uh, because Meshri will be supporting uh, scheduling performance tests, uh, which is a very long running task, that is, let's say you do it on every fortnight or something. So what you can do is you can schedule that thing using in cluster context, and that's fine. Once it's scheduled, it's, it will, it's, its execution is going to be completely isolated. If, uh, let, let's say in future you change your context to Minikube or context C, context D, it doesn't matter because that particular execution has been, um, uh, it's a sort of isolated from the rest of the handlers that will be um, triggered later. Uh, this is something that uh, that was uh, sort of possible earlier, but it's now far more granular than it earlier was. Um, so every operation is very isolated uh, after after this PR gets merged. So these are some more uh, like uh, features of this particular PR. That's it. Cool. So, so we're about out of time. There, there was a couple, there's um, some other items on the agenda that, that I wanted to, one of which I wanted to hit very quickly um, with a couple of the maintainers like Michael and Rudraksh. And, and there's a collection of, of people here. Um, so Luke Juggery, he's a, um, a friend of the community, a friend of the project. Um, Luke had you know, worked on an alternative method of installing Meshery. I think I didn't really read, I gotta be honest, I didn't read what he had said. Um, I, my guess is that he worked on this because he, because Meshery is a bring your own Kubernetes cluster tool. And I think what he's presenting here is um, a set of a multi pass or a set of scripts that Brings a Kubernetes, brings a VM, brings a Kubernetes cluster, and brings meshery for you. So, the, assuming that that's accurate, the question for you all is: Do you think that that's a good idea? Is that something that the project would want to uplift and support, and potentially incorporate as, you know, a supported um, deployment method? Or is it something to um, keep uh, to well? Well, we don't. The, the project right now doesn't really have the, this. This isn't the first time that someone has brought this kind of a thing. The last time it was um, 
it was a, it was a nice individual from Russia whose name I forget, but he had done it using Ansible and some other things. And because uh, he, he too wanted like a, a VM environment to run meshery and run serv service mesh. Um, and at the time we had extended an invitation to him to put those scripts into the install folder in the meshery repo. Meshery as a project has, is, very, is extensible and has the concept of um, third-party plugins which is good, but, it, but we don't, as a project, have the concept of, gosh, what is it? Uh, boy, words fail me today. Uh, as like a <laughs> related, but um, related, but more or less not directly supported by the project, uh, an ecosystem thing like what do you call it a cap or like a uh, like 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 you know the, what luke has done here is great the question is do we have enough um you know calories to, do you have enough uh energy to be able to support an, yet another install process and before leaning in and saying yes it's sort of a quick assessment like why well, gosh can, can we sustain that and it's Luke intending to hang around to help people as they bump into inevitable bugs and that kind of thing. And, uh, and so from my perspective, just to lead the question, I guess, is to say like, yeah, yeah, is to embrace it and say, yes, this is great um, to, to at minimum um, link to it and, and like um, tell people this is an alternative you know, approach um, but maybe caveat it in such a way that it's like, uh, how do we say it's in, it's in the ecosystem repo or like it's in the, like it's a use at your own, it, it's not the mainstream. It is yet to graduate, it's like a, it's an idea and, and we embrace it, but it's yet to be um, fully incorporated into the test plan and like a uh, part, you know, the, first class in the project and, and or to find just like let's go ahead and make it first class and just say hey this is another approach and list it as under the getting started and and then come what may in terms of uh bugs <laughs> i think that this i think my understanding just from having just from knowing luke is that he, he's trying to facilitate learning so people who want to learn a service mesh and use meshery and might also be trying to learn Kubernetes, that like he's trying to help overcome that portion of it, I think. Any opinions here? I think from that point of view, it really makes sense to have sort of like an easy package all in one uh, learning um, solution or approach so that you don't have to worry about, you know, installing some sort of Kubernetes um, distribution locally and, and, and struggle with the endpoints and things that we struggle a little bit with. So from that point of view, I think it's, it, it would be good. And also to see that it actually runs on KTS. Um, that'd be nice in, in his setup. Um, so, so, so I think we should sort of pursue it a little bit and um, think a little bit about it and, and maybe in order to foster this sort of um, ecosystem, um, like have a, you know, a, a, often if I remember correctly, it's, uh, you know, you have um, like tooling around it or, or additional uh, tooling and then you have sort of like um, unsupported or unofficial or um, section where, where tools like this could be listed. And, and that sort of carries a certain weight because we say, yeah, this is, you know, this is good and we embrace it, but we don't have the, the bandwidth to sort of support it um, directly. Yeah, and what, yeah, that's a good one. One, I, it hadn't occurred to me, Michael, but, but like part of the challenge that we have with exercising all the test cases is, was like, well, in, in the, GitHub workflows that we execute, we need to spin up a VM, spin up a Kubernetes cluster, deploy meshery, deploy and run through exercise its code. And actually, th this could be a way of 
or you know, this could we could reuse this in those tests, which would also be a way of kind of supporting it and verifying that it works. So. Yeah, so yes, it, so it could be a way to uh, quickly create sort of all in all in one environment and then throw them away again once we finish testing without having sort of to worry about kind and the other things we worry about in these tests. I know that um, part of Luke's thinking we had had a comment. He'd been really interested in the learning paths that the community has been working on that have yet to be officially released, but I dropped a link to it in the chat uh, that um, I think he was, he's all, his thought process was sort of in this same learning vein. So, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? It, um, any other comments, Michael, or does anybody else have? Them? Okay, it's in the venue. Uh, Good. Yeah, we have one more topic to discuss uh, that needs discussion. So uh, Aditya Narayan, uh, your PR on uh, pull request laborer, uh, labeler uh, needs some discussion, I guess, like uh, if Rudraksha or Lee could talk about. Oh uh, yeah, Aditya, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like we said, we need to talk about it. So yeah, the I had previously uh, made a pull request on enabling this pull request for the release drafter action, right? Uh, but the problem was the the GitHub token we were using, the that secret personal access token was not uh, enabling that uh, the, the labels to appear correctly. So that was preventing it. And the documentation suggested that we use a different token, but when I suggested that to Rudra, he said that it may, uh, you know, affect the release uh, release draft part of the our right. It may affect the release right because he shared me a doc which said that uh, that certain permissions were not uh, adequately given by the GitHub Actions token, so we could not change it. So thus, I created a new workflow for the same. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we were uh, just yeah. going to read. So I'm just reading through Rude Rosh's notes. Um, what a pat can be. So responding to his comments, like that makes sense. Um, a pat can be, and we have in the past, pasted a pat into a secret. And then the secret is available to workflows. Uh, and then therefore, so is the pat. So I, um, I just wasn't. Yeah, I just wasn't sure. Like, if uh, we do, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, the, the goal, the goals here are that we want to have auto, auto, auto categorized release notes that um, take care of cleaning themselves up, which we generally do, and that's done based on labels. You know, that that contributions are categorized based on labels. Okay, if people don't label PRs, which most of us don't then um, then, then the release notes don't, they're just, everything is just in miscellaneous in the release notes. So we wanted to auto label pull requests based on the types of files that are being changed or the file path, like the location of where those files are being changed because there's the UI path, there's the docs path, there's the, you know, and, and so we can auto apply labels to a lot of things based on that. We were, and so, yeah, and so the the personal access to, yeah, the release drafter, by the way, so there's a long, there's a super long history with, with release drafter and security in 
GitHub. And in essence, what Rudraksh is saying is true. And we've got it documented like in a bunch of, in a few different places about the fact that you ultimately need a personal access token to overcome the security, the, the way that GitHub has the workflows working. <clears throat> and so it's not uncommon for projects to you projects or just any software project to have a robot account or a service account of which Meshery does have a robot account. If you've ever, you, you'll, I, won't, I won't spoil the surprise, you can go find out which one it is, what the name of it is. But that robot account um, is, a, is a common resource for the project. And so it is empowered with admin privileges to be able to execute on things just like this. And so a pat from that account is documented um, and accessible to maintainers. And so that pat can be used you know, from the service account. Rudraksh, you keep laying down, you keep laying down the challenges and I think I keep knocking them down. And I'm, where do we stand? I, anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm really sensitive to the fact that like we have a horrible history or uh, record, track record of going way over time. So like we're over time on this, like uh, hopefully that helps you guys, let's hit it again if that doesn't get us past where we need to go. Neha, can we hit your thing real quick? Because because you're getting stuck on this. Yeah. Hey, hi. Uh, yeah, I I share my screen. Cool. And now, hey, by the way, I, for my part, I know that we're over time for a number of you. There's some of you that are hanging out to have a UX discussion. Great. I'm gonna hang out. And we're gonna have that. But yeah. um, if if other people have things going on and you need to drop, yes. we definitely had a great call today. Um, you know, please hang out, but if you need to go, it was nice to see you all. All right, yeah. so Neha, yeah, if you would. Yeah, uh, so here, here what is happening here is like, I have deployed the Prometheus and Grafana uh, in the Meshri, uh, uh, this Istio system namespace, if you see Grafana and Prometheus. And I have a couple of apps running as well, like uh, the product ratings app, book info app, I mean, and it has all those ports. And uh, uh, and also, if you see, I have uh, like Meshri running in the Meshri namespace, Meshri server, with all of the adapters, like Istio and all. So uh, what I'm doing here is like, if I access this Meshri on my Docker platform, uh, I could see that the connection is successfully connected to Minikube as I have a Minikube cluster, but uh, the problem here is if I go inside lifecycle Istio, uh, here it should show me all those uh, lifecycle. I mean, earlier it was showing me like, but today, I mean, from yesterday, uh, sometimes it showed, sometimes it does not. I'm not sure is it my browser is sure what. So here I should see all the lifecycle operations and installation. So. I don't see that here. Uh, and the, and what, and I'll show here, like if you see my Grafana dashboard, uh, the data source is Prometheus and I have like a couple of the static uh, Istio boards uh, here. And uh, the, I could see the data and control plane dashboards, if you see, because uh, I mean, I could see because of all the Istio components I have running, control plane components. Uh, that's why I see the data here. But if I come here to workload dashboards, I, I mean, I'm missing few of the data. So I wanted to understand on this part, like, uh, I mean, I have a book in for applications. So am I missing anything here to populate the data? That's what. Because what I understood from my debugging is uh, the Prometheus is missing few of the targets here. Like uh, if you see, like uh, I have 42 pods, but only four active. Service endpoints also, if only one is active. So I think this is this might be the uh, issue here. That's why it's not exposing the data here. This is what I'm understanding or uh, I mean, this yeah. is one of the thing I have trouble, I mean, investigated, but you can correct me if I'm not going anywhere wrong. It seems like it was a great walkthrough. I mean, it seems like you, um, it, when you go to the control plane dashboard, it, yeah. it, 
it's also empty. I think you, oh, okay. So this is yeah. positive, good. Yeah, um, this is populating, yes. I mean, I could see like, uh, if I can show you the memory here, uh, like all this, uh, I mean, it, sorry, just one minute. Uh, this is working control plane because I think I have all these Istio components running, the control plane components. That's why it's showing me data. And uh, if you see here, I have like in Prometheus, I could see all the Istio endpoints. Cool. Can you go? I didn't, I missed it. Can you go back uh, to? So this portion is working. That's great. The, if you go back to your kubectl output, did you end up, do you have a, a, you have the sample application deployed and there's an element that Utkarsh was noting um, about the notion that the, so, so this is good, this is entirely expected, we don't have any bugs yet. Um, <clears throat> there's no workload data metrics because the sample app itself is not, it's off the mesh. It is not running on, Istio mesh. One way that you can tell from the output here is that there, um, the applications, the service, the pods, rather details, reviews, ratings, they would have uh, like a two of two. They would have two containers running, uh, a secondary sidecar. Oh, and okay. Mm -hmm. So a totally easy, you know, like a totally easy thing to overlook. Um, but that's why that particular board isn't working. Um, it, you can still further your, I mean, one, you can go back and, and you know, get onboard the sample app, but two, you can also verify that in Meshery's UI, and this is probably the thing to do right now. Like if you go back to Meshery's UI, if you go over to settings, if you go to metrics. Um, yeah, this is just give me a minute. I just have the, here, I'll open in a new work tab. Okay, and then just when you're looking at Grafana, <clears throat> um, that you would choose the um, control plane board from the, yeah, yep, there you go. Oh, here I don't see the list. It was showing me earlier, today it's not showing me here. Yes, yeah. we do, there are, there's, there's some buggery here. If you, can you do me a favor, can you nav back to like the dashboard? And then go ahead and head back to settings. This one, right? Yep, to Grafana. And then let's, so you can see like it's having some problems communicating. Yeah. But yeah, if you do the drop down again. Okay, anyway, when, like when, when you do get that, when you do, like, like there, there's, there's, like this is worth documenting this, this experience right here, because it's like, hey, look, you're having to jimmy with it or you're having to like fid fiddle with it to anyway if when you do see the control plane in the drop down you should then get metrics and that that's good and then yeah once you onboard your apps you should be able to get metrics from the workloads board as well but the issue that i would if i were you and i would go file in a bug on is this right here like th this is like whether you were getting yeah. metrics or not you should be seeing the boards from the first start this has okay. plagued the project for a long time. We use the Prometh the Grafana SDK. I would surely like uh, file the bug for this. And, uh, and uh, the second part here is, uh, do we need something here? Like, um, yeah, there's a, cra there's a crappy UI or a put new. Yeah, it's a crappy UX. It's a super powerful thing. We, there's a ton of power in these two, these two things and we just, the, 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 there's a couple of bugs and bad UX getting in the way, but what this lets you do is if you have um, a prior investment in Grafana boards and you've curated your own set of metrics that you're looking mm -hmm. at and you like, but you want to run some performance tests and so you want to see those same metrics mm -hmm. in Meshery at the same time, what that Prometheus paste, that, that text field lets you do is <clears throat> on the Prometheus tab, and, and even this is a little bit confusing, I think, for people, because like what you what you would do is you can go into Grafana, grab the JSON out descriptor of a given board, paste mm -hmm. it, in, and then you can have your own custom board, in like very quickly incorporated into Meshery. Oh. And eventually, yeah. So. Okay. 
this is i mean this is fine like uh, we can anyways customize this board like we can have our own board here paste it anytime yeah. uh, so the first point here is uh, do we have anything like to inject sidecar here any labels on the namespace and all we need something like that injection yeah. enabled or what that's exactly the thing yeah um when you i believe that right now the operations for the istio adapter are such that if you provision the sample app, mm -hmm. you, actually, if you, yeah, I mean, if you provision the sample app using the Istio adapter, it will auto configure that label for the default namespace, I think. And if it doesn't, you can play with it and just confirm that you, there's a control in there to turn it on and off as well. Okay. Label okay. Up. Oh. Uh, do you mean from here or from the? Yep, from there. Yep. Oh, here is two. Uh huh. Actually, I yeah, there are like uh, I could see few of those uh, UI, but this is I think this is also a bug or not sure. I could I could see this like blank. Don't see anything adapter list here. Cool. Yep. So. Uh... Let me just change my browser as well. I'm not so, yeah, sure. so, so on this one, so so good. So I, we've let me hand you off to a couple of other. This is a good. This is a good session. It got you a little bit further. The that. Yeah, needs to if be you good. see, I can see here in Firefox. <laughs> ah, okay, cool. Anyway, the, if you go to apply service mesh configuration, the box in the middle, the plus sign, one of Automatic. the options. Yeah, and so. Uh, yeah. Oh, so now, this is. Uh, Okay, default namespace. I will click Istio system. Yeah, no, I actually don't. Don't. Um, you actually did it correct there when you applied it to default. Let, let me. Let's. Um, actually, let's my the, app is running in. Okay. Yeah, it should be running in default. You just got to go roll your go delete, okay. go kill your pods, and the deployment will reboot the pods and they'll come back up with sidecar. Okay, I'll do the like delete here and deploy in default. And then based on the time, let me, let's move on. If sure, we okay. Okay. I can do it later as well. Uh, so you don't want me in Istio system. You want me in default. Why? So like we can have in any other thing, right? Yep. You can make up any other name you want to as well. Okay. Fine. Fine. I'll do this. Like, uh, and I will verify, like I could see the workload data as well in my Grafana. And, uh, right. And just the last one more query about this performance test. So what I'll do is I will just trigger that, uh, product page endpoint here. And I will run this test and I will verify like uh, if I see if you, some of the errors. You were saying some there is some network connectivity. That's why you were seeing the errors in this performance results. Yep. Uh, so yeah. How do we debug that? Like, what was the network connectivity? Do you mean like uh, different, uh, some of the like uh, rules and all firewall you mean, or uh, I did not got that? Yeah, the endpoint that you had had in your screenshot was, I think, localhost. It was basically meshery generating load against itself, I think. Mm -hmm. and, I don't, and that's fine, but I don't know that the particular endpoint that you had listed was necessary. It, the way that the output read was like, oh, 100% failure because the, the load generator inside of meshery server couldn't actually hit reach the endpoint that you were trying to generate load against. So. So okay. I would. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I will use on any other URL apart from local or store. I will check that. Okay, that should be fine. Cool, that's great. Okay, so I think this test I think is sufficient. I'll update my results after a few. Uh, I will I will test this out whatever issues and I will update the results. That's awesome. And then Neha, this gets us all closer to your other. This is a great and thing. Yeah, so the other thing uh, I want to tell you about the work you have set me to like investigate the difference between the SMP metrics and the node exporter. So on that, I want to discuss with you uh, like a few points there. So can we have another call for that? Like any other time uh, uh, or do you want to discuss now? I can go ahead now as well. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't, uh, yep. On the community call is, is maybe the best uh, spot uh, because we're, because we're about to have a UX conversation with a few folks who are. Okay, sure, sure. So just, I wanted to understand from there is like, uh, I have seen few of the like SMP uh, metrics already code, some of the code in meshery. 
uh, where it shows i think the parameters uh, which we use but uh, i did not understood the static boards do you mean these are my static boards or these are my dynamic boards that's i'm not clear between if on friday's community call is what i mean <laughs> okay sorry sorry yeah. okay sure i let's connect on friday i'll i'll, I'll we can discuss there thank you I'm so totally, much yeah i'm totally excited by the way uh, by the way i just for everyone else who's watching here I, I can't help myself but say this that uh there's a reason there's a there's a couple of reasons why neha is being is talked about when she's not here and uh, in the in a good way and why she's being successful right now is because she's tenacious like she's curious about it she's going after it she's getting her, she's asking her questions she's getting them answered and and it's been like that for a long time and she just keeps she's, just keeps being um, uh, more of, she just keeps growing in, in the impact of the work that she's doing. And it's um, tremendous. I mean, like a lot of other people just, I don't get it. And like hit the, you know, <laughs> give up. Hey. And so. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, like Lee. And thank you community, like all the guys who are helping here. This is really great, like working, uh, learning new things. Thank you everyone. Did, did, yeah. we'll, we'll try to hit you before Friday as well, like with some of the questions. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you.